Hello, mess historians. We are the people who love the history and we love the mess and we love the Gilded Age. And it is time to get to our review for the Gilded Age season two, episode three. I'm going to start this one in the Russell's household. So we begin with the Russell's hosting a tea in order to raise money for the new Metropolitan Opera House. The big question on George's mind is, honey, are you okay with inviting Turner over here? And Bertha is okay with it. She's fine because she knows that she has the upper hand where Turner is concerned. Don't worry about her, honey. Leave her to me. But since you mentioned it, speaking of Turner, Bertha does warn Church that, hey, I've got someone coming, a guest who might surprise you a little bit, but don't be alarmed. And that's all that she says. I was hoping that they probably carried on a conversation off camera that we did not see. But as we all know, he didn't know who this special guest was until she arrived. No one knew. And I am asking you all, why on God's green earth would she not just tell church who was coming so that the entire staff could be prepared so that Adelaide doesn't go running right into George as soon as she sees him and then she's freaking out downstairs telling everybody about it. Why did she not just have the conversation? Maybe because she's just thinking about things from her own perspective. Bertha was not in a tizzy about Turner coming over. She just wants her money for this new opera project. That's all that she cares about. So she'll put her issues with her to the side to get down to business. And that is one thing that I like about the Russells. When it's time to get down to business, whatever petty things are going on, they will put them to the side. Even if they're not so petty, when it's time to handle business, they both, George and Bertha, handle business. I like that. And as we knew it would, Turner's arrival shocks everyone. Why didn't Bertha understand this? I don't know. Adelaide looked like she saw a ghost as Turner, who was way, way too comfortable in her new position as a lady of the city. She just tosses her jacket at Adelheid as if to say, here you servant, take this. I have important things to talk about with the lady of the house. And even Church got a little bit of a jump scare when she put her calling card down his plate. But once they get Adelheid back downstairs, the tea goes on as planned and they're able to get on down to business. It is announced that Bertha is on the board, which we know would have never been the case last season, but she's come a mighty long way. And Turner is not impressed. She's not impressed by this at all. But Bertha announces that opening night for the season is going to be October 22nd, 1883. And that was, in real life, also the opening season for the Academy. So both houses did kick off their seasons on the same night that year. Again, the episode is called Head to Head. So these opera houses are going head to head. People are going to have to make a choice. Nobody's going to get to be neutral or lukewarm about it. People are going to have to make a decision. Which brings us to Ward McAllister, our famous little two-faced friend who's been straddling the fence for as long as he possibly can. And he's still doing the same thing today, attending Bertha's tea. And then he's going to mosey right across 61st Street to go over to Agnes Van Ryan's house to do the same thing with her. But when he gets there for Miss Astor's tea, he'll have a little bit of intel because now he knows the opening night for the Met. And I just have to say, do I have any Seinfeld fans here? When he was crossing 61st Street... It reminded me of the Frogger episode when George Costanza was crossing the street and it looked like he was playing the video game Frogger. Anyway, that's what that reminded me of. But back to Bertha's tea. She wants to know if Turner is going to get signed up for her and her husband to get a box at the new opera house. And Turner is asking her, what, are you threatening to out me? And that came from nowhere because Bertha was not threatening to out her. She's telling her you should get get a box at both houses you have one there get one here as well and Turner throws a little slick shade because Mrs. Fish is there as well and she's telling her oh yeah well you know I knew this woman who was so desperate to get a box at the academy but she couldn't and so now of course she's going to jump ship and get on with the Metropolitan because she basically she has no choice 
Of course, we all know that she's talking about Bertha, and Bertha still doesn't care. And I guess that Bertha's being unbothered by that just brought out that nasty little devil in Turner who had to ask her about her husband. Oh, George didn't tell you about us? Excuse me, honey? What do you mean, George? You mean Mr. Russell. That's Mr. Russell to you. I don't care if you're calling yourself Mrs. Winterton now. It's Mr. Russell to you. Oh, oh, he didn't tell you? That's funny. I thought that that's why I got sacked. Because you were jealous of me and your husband. Wow. Bertha had to try to put on a poker face because Mrs. Fish was ready to see her ballroom. But we know that that got under her skin. And oh my gosh, how I wish that at that moment, Bertha knew the facts so she could quickly come back and just say, oh, you mean the night that my husband rejected you? And say it really loudly, you know? But she didn't know the facts. And this is something that it actually pains me to say because George Russell, I love you. I love you probably more than Turner loves you, but you were so wrong. You should have told Bertha exactly what happened right after it happened. And you should have taken the same measures to squash Turner. The same measures that you took to squash your stenographer. You should have taken those measures to squash Turner and let her know that she would be able to do nothing more than be a scullery maid at some fine house in New York City. But you didn't do that. And now she's run amok and she's making life for your wife a living hell so bertha has to basically pull out every little detail from george asking him question by question what happened nothing happened well why does she tell me this okay she came into my room did she come into your room or into your bed okay into my bed well did you get out yeah i got out did she get out no she didn't like after you're going to go in and tell her what's going on, he should have just laid out the whole story because now we're in it, right? And she should have left that conversation feeling confident that the next time that I see her, I can let her know, oh, oh yeah, what went on between you and my husband? You mean the time that he kicked you out of his bed because he thought that you were me and then when he realized that it was just you? a lowly servant of mine then he kicked you out she should have been able to leave that conversation with that kind of confidence but that's not how julian fellows plays it you know if you're like me and you watch downton abbey i know that there are several conversations that you all know went in a similar fashion especially a lot of conversations involving mr bates like, if we, they would just say everything, then we could be past this thing, but it's going to, like, drag out. But anyway, that didn't happen. It's neither here nor there. The Russells were going to be okay. They're going to get past this. But where we stand after this conversation is that George is in the doghouse. But he can make it up to Bertha. And he can do that by getting her a sit-down meeting with the Duke of Buckingham. Apparently, Turner's new husband already knows him, and they are supposed to entertain him and receive him in Newport at some point really soon. Bertha's got something in her mind, and she wants to meet him and do something big. George is going to have to make this happen. We know that George is all for helping Bertha to get her revenge on these nasty ladies. But until George is out of the doghouse... He's got a guest coming, and he needs for his wife to have his back because she said that she would. What? Well, that was before this betrayal. Look, honey, I've got Bill Henderson coming, and we need to put on a really good show. You've got to entertain him for me. Well, okay, like I said earlier, this couple, they know how to put aside petty things when it's time to get business done, and they do that. They entertain Bill Henderson. And the only thing that I can say about this man is that from what we are seeing, he looks like a man who is standing on his principles. And George might be wrong about every man having his price. But we'll see how that turns out. And while George is trying to understand from Bertha just what more he can do, look, I threw the girl out of my bed. I didn't want to upset the order of the house. What more can I do? 
There's a knock on Bertha's door. She's already pissed off. Who is it? Ugh, that annoying Gladys. What do you want? <laughs> Gladys can tell if something's going wrong. Uh, I can come back later. And look, we've all been there when we wanted something from our parents. We wanted them to be in the best mood possible if we wanted to ask, especially if we wanted to go somewhere where we didn't think that they would let us go. We want them to be in a super good mood. So I don't blame Gladys. Don't worry about it. I don't need anything. I can come back later. Look, Gladys wants to go out. She wants to go out to the Union Theater to see Oscar Wilde's new play, and she'll be escorted by John Adams. We know that she'll be safe. Bertha says that it's fine. Go ahead. I think that Bertha just didn't care about anything at that moment, so Gladys got lucky that she walked in when she did. And speaking of that play, it was a big date night for everybody. Marion was there with her new love interest. We'll see if that goes anywhere. Oscar was there with his new young lady. And the play looked like it was boring everyone to pieces. Now, this was also something that was real. This was Oscar Wilde's debut play in New York City. And it opened to horrible reviews. I'm going to share one of those reviews with you on this video. And then I'm going to make a separate video showing some of the other reviews. It was all thumbs down. Now, Oscar Wilde may not have been the greatest playwright on that night, but he was the most astute man in the room when it came to observing Oscar and John Adams. Aurora Fane didn't seem to understand that Oscar Wilde was hinting at the fact that it looked like John Adams and Oscar Van Ryn likely share each other's man meat, but that's not anything that Aurora Fane is supposed to know because she has been reared so well. So here's one of those reviews. Oscar Wilde's play debuted on August 20th, 1883. Here's a review from August 22nd, 1883. And this review is in the Buffalo Commercial. It reads in part, After dissecting Oscar Wilde's play, pulverizing the fragments, and scattering the ashes to the four winds of heaven, Mr. Willie Winter, the Tribune critic, patronizingly observes, he has produced a dull play on a tedious subject, but it is a play that may be sharpened by judicious pruning and made useful on the road. Well, perhaps with a lot of work, that play will work somewhere else, but not here in New York City. And that must have been true because the play only ran for one week. But I'll put some more of those reviews in a separate video, as well as review the rest of this episode in another video we'll talk about what happened across the street at the Van Rines. But until then, let me know what you think is going to happen in the next episode or later on this season. I have a lot of interest in that rat, that footman who Turner gave the wink to, who's been keeping in touch with her. Is he going to be the one to tell all of Bertha's business to these ladies who don't like her in New York City? Is he going to be the one who tells everybody the truth about Chef Borden? Is he going to expose all of the secrets that are going on in the Russell household? I think that the Russells better keep an eye on that guy. Let me know any of your predictions that you have for the upcoming episodes this season, and I'll put them in a fan's predictions video. We did that last time, and it was fun. Thanks for watching this one with me, and don't forget, if you want to know real stories about some of these real people who are in this show, check out my videos. I've made videos about the real Mrs. Chamberlain, the real Stanford White, the real T. Thomas Fortune, and the real Ward McAllister. This video has been brought to you by me. Well, my Patreon is a sponsor for this video. If you like these dirty scandals on my channel, then you'll love my Patreon, Ties Too Hot, Hot Mess History. It has all of the stuff that I can't talk about or show here because it's just too hot, too violent, too sexual, too graphic, too much. Come and join us there for the Hot, Hot Mess History. The link is in the description box.